I remember one night specifically, um, my, my buddies and I, we went out and we went on a robin spree. I had called my barber, man, it was like 11 o'clock at night, man. I called my barber and I asked him to get a haircut. I'm in the barber shop getting my haircut, me and my barber, we watching the Black Album. We walk in, he locks the door, he put clothes, you know, people would knock on the door. 11 o'clock at night, people would knock on the door and they'll be like, hey, let me in. He'd be like, no, I'm only cutting one dude. Right. Somebody else will knock on the door because they tried to get in, you know, they're like, no, no, you know, I'm only cutting this guy. And, uh... I'm sitting there getting my hair cut, man. This guy, he comes, he pulls on the door, except the door opens. Hmm. So, of course, like, we're kind of, like, looking, like, okay, how did this guy get in? Right. Like, we just saw five people just walk by and, uh, and not have the ability to come through the doors. Comes in, man. He was clearly homeless, you know, you know, not looking great, not smelling great, whatever the case may be. And I'm sitting in a chair. We're all kind of, like, staring at each other. And he points at me and he says... You're a pastor. Whew. And then he leaves out. Of course, like, it was a joke, right? Because I'm like, man, the route I'm going, man, I'm going to be in prison. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. Thank you for joining us today. We are on location at Remedy Church in Akron. I got my brother, I got my friend, Deontay Lavender, pastor, elder, founder of the Remedy. Brother, how you doing? Man, I'm good, bro. I'm good, man. It's good to be with you, man. You've been doing some amazing stuff. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Thank you for doing this today, man. Thank oh, you. for sure. Man, it's early for me. <laughs> no, you're good, man. You're good. You're good, man. The grind starts early. Man. That's right. That's right. We don't want to sleep in too long. My perfect day starts at noon, though. So, sorry. All right, I appreciate I you. In this <laughs> season of my life, man, I wish, man. I wish it started at noon, brother. <laughs> I appreciate you getting me up, getting me out the house as early. You got the house as early. So I just want to take some time today, man, just to talk to you, get to know you, you know, talk about what's going on at, at Remedy, you know, find out more just about all the amazing stuff y'all are doing. Because you have an amazing church, an amazing congregation God, here, man. You guys are doing God. a lot of things in the community. So I just want to just have the audience get a chance just to hear a little bit more from you and hear more about you. So, you know, tell us, where, where's your background? Where did you grow up? Um, well, for me, um, I grew up in Cleveland. Okay. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, um, down the way, um, and yeah man that's that's where i grew up i mean it's not the greatest story but it's my story that's right um you know my mother you know had some struggles we we kind of maneuvered in the shelter system for a very long time and uh, my mother found her way man and is doing absolutely great i mean absolutely great she owns businesses man. there you go it's a great job man that she's been working at for the last 20 years and um yeah man she, she's poured everything into me um you know taught me work ethic taught me not to quit taught me uh not to allow adversity to stop you know whatever god is doing in my life man but from there went to mlk high school on 71st and huff i don't even think it's a high school anymore i think okay. they shut it down now uh but went there and then college um i went to ball and wallace college met my wife at bw and um honestly man it was like around you know 18 19 is when i, I really started getting into church and trying to figure out you know my purpose in life and um yeah i've been going since then um, i've been going since then so you know, that's the truncated version of, you know, where I came from and, yeah. you know, how I got to where I am now. When you say down the way, what were we talking about? Where was you at? Um, you know, I, I used to be in the 40th projects with all my guys. Man. There you go. So, you know what I mean? Like you always say, you know, you know, 4 to the double nickel. Man. So anywhere <laughs> between 40th and 55th, that's where you can find me um, at some point in my life, man, with my guys. And um, yeah, yeah. Some of them still down there. Some of them. Then moved out out of town and you know so on and so forth, man. But yeah, was down there a lot uh, when I was in my younger days. Okay. So were you always? First of all, I need to back up for a second. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I didn't know you graduated from BW. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. I, I don't believe I didn't know BW. that. Yep, graduated from BW, man. I, um, yeah, yeah. Got there in 2007. Took five years to graduate because I switched my minor. Um, at some point in time, just based off of what I thought I wanted to do in that point in time in my life, it's funny how we can um, tell somebody who's 18 years old to like define and, and 
definitely tell me what you want to do for the rest of your life. Right. Um, it's a very tough thing. Um, now that I'm, you know, now I'm in my, my mid thirties and I'm trying to think like, how can you tell a person that? Um, I, I know people in their forties who are still trying to figure out life. And what we do is we tell a person at 18, you have to pick a major and stick with it for the rest of your life. It's a, uh, it's a tough thing to do. Um, but I ended up switching. I did five years in school, graduated 2012, got married 2013. Congrats. And, uh, kind of kept it moving from there. There you go. Yeah. I worked at BW for for nine years okay. doing major gift fundraising. So that's why I'm like, I don't believe that I didn't know that. So Oh, wow. wow. You know, what years did you work at BW then? Oh, man, you just tested me. It is, two th- I started there in 2012. I started there in 2012. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. I just don't believe in our conversation that never came up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, wife, my wife is a BW graduate also. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. That's dope, man. That's dope. So, yeah, when you came in, I was, I was already out. Yeah. So that makes sense. But, no, that's dope. So were you always around, were you always a Christian? Were you always living for God? Like what was, talk to me a little bit about that. No, not, not at all, man. Um, yeah, church was never on my radar. Okay. Um, and not to say like in the black culture, the black ethos, man, like you, you know, church, you know what I mean? So to say that I didn't know anything about Jesus, that would be you know, drastic. That would be That's kind real. of an exaggeration. I think that, you know, church is riddled within the black culture. Mm. So my entire life, I mean, I, I went to churches for funerals and weddings and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, my aunts and my mom would drag me to church on, you know, Christmas, Mother's Day and Easter. Um, but outside of that, yeah, I wasn't practicing any type of Christianity. Right. Um, I do believe that I can pinpoint the time in which I got saved, but even after I got saved, I did nothing with um we did nothing with the faith, man. You know, I'll be honest, I used to tell people, yeah, you know, I used to look up to gangsters. Like, that's you know what I mean? Thing. Like, you know, and, and not to say that I was the biggest this or the biggest that, but I know that that's what I looked up to. Um catch is God just kept me in, in good places and in good spaces. And so um my education I stuck with my education no matter what I thought was cool so I had decent grades um, I always found myself in the right circles with individuals right. um, I had a full ride to BW not because I was crazy smart but just because I knew how to network as a young teenager and I ended up finding myself in a great organization at the time it was called the Barbara Bird Bennett Scholars but okay. um, it kind of moved into the BW Scholars and they just gave us a free scholarship if we had average grades. Um, so when I tell you favor found me, um, because I don't know based off of my grades and the way that I was coming up, I don't know if I'd ever really got a scholarship anywhere. Um, I always said I wanted to go to college, but I don't know if it was something that was actually tangible. Mm-hmm. But I got into that program. They got me to school. And uh, I'll be honest, even in BW, I just had average grades. Um, I did enough to get by and, you know, and yeah, that's just what it is. But I never thought about church um the thing that kind of got me to church and to be 100 percent honest man i met my wife in 2007 and i really wanted to date her and she's just like man you know i i can't really date a guy who doesn't go to church like you you gotta go to church she wasn't asking me to do anything else she's like yeah. but you gotta at least go to church i'm like if this is the bare minimal to get like somebody that's beautiful there you go uh, let me go for it yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna be the first to tell anybody who's watching man hey my <laughs> wife got me into church uh, i don't know if i if i did not meet my wife i don't know if i would be sitting here i know mm. god's plan is more sovereign than all of ours but hey, man he would have probably found a way to get me here but i know my story is i met my wife my wife said let's go to church mm came to church um, and it was the most humbling experience. Um, It was the most captivating experience. Um, I had never felt anything like it. Um, I had never met people who were so focused on making me better. Um, And I think that that's what made me fall in love. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I really and I legitimately love serving people. That's what's up. Um, So, you know, with, with those things, I was just kind of like, yeah, like, I, I want to I wanna do this. Yeah. Um, and so I went in, I, I went in full steam ahead. So that she was like really your wake up moment. Like that was like, that was your, okay, 
this this was what brought me here. This is what God used yeah, to bring and me I, here. Yeah, and I don't know if she was my wake up moment. I know she was the one that introduced me. Okay. Um, yeah, she was the one that introduced me. Um, there's a study that says, you know, a person gives their life to Christ, you know, based off of something cataclysmic or non cataclysmic. Cataclysmic is something just drastic, that's crazy. Something happens. Non cataclysmic is that somebody just wakes up one day and right. says, Man, I think I need to get my life together. You know, so for me, my wife introduced me, but I think after a series of, you know, breakups with my wife and mm. just really looking introspectively on like where I wanted to go. Um, it was some of those cataclysmic things that kind of uh, was the culmination of me saying, you know what, it, it's, it's time to like turn, like turn another way. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's my wake up call kind of came separately. Um, I don't know if I don't know if my heart for God would be as genuine as it is if my wake up call was just connected to a person. That's good. But I praise God that she was the one that introduced me to this lifestyle. That's good. Mm -hmm. What would you say that wake up call was then? Like what, when you, when God like really was just like, OK, look, man, it was just one of those things where in my life at some point in time, like I just felt like things were spiraling. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's what it is. I just mm -hmm. felt like things were spiraling and not to a degree where I felt like um, I was going to be in a poor house or not have anything. But it was to the degree of saying, like, you know, I, I just didn't know what my future like what it held for me. Um, um, my wife and I, like, she was my girlfriend, and we had broke up, and I was just like, man, like, I thought this was supposed to be my wife, so you got that going crazy. After we broke up, ministry things started to happen, and it wasn't going that well in ministry, and then relational um, guys that I was around, I was half in the streets, but then half in the church, and, you know, that wasn't working out for me, and, you know, just things weren't going right, and I think at some point in time, I'm like, well, if they say that he is the one that can make the crooked road straight, mm -hmm. if he is the one that can make the wrong right, then at some point in time, man, I, I got to get my I got to get myself together. I think that that just a combination of those that many things just not going as well as I wanted them to go. Um, I was out and teaching 12th grade and 9th grade English at North Ridgeville High School mm -hmm. at one point in time. And I'm like, I hate this. Right. Like, you know, what I mean, it just it wasn't for me. Um, nothing against the students, nothing against the teachers, nothing against the profession. But at that point in time, I'm like, I kind of felt like I was just out there. And so at some point in time, I said, I have to grasp onto something that is like forever, like that is sturdy. Um, I've learned that what you can see and what you can touch are the most temporal things in the world. But the one that you have probably never seen um, with your eyes wide open, he's the one that's the most permanent thing. That's and real. So I just said, man, let me grasp on to that and just try that. I had tried everything else. And so, you know, yeah, let me just try him. And right. um, I'm happy that I made that decision. No, man, I feel you. That was it's, it was interesting because for me my wake up call was, was it, things got drastic. Like I had to hit rock bottom before God was like, you're going to try me now. Do you want to, do you really want to try Jesus now? Like I had, I was, I'm that hard headed person. We had to teach the lesson to like yeah. 50 times before I was like, okay, I'm putting my hands on, I'm done with it. Like, yeah, I know people like that brother. Yeah. You sit next to one of them, unfortunately. Like I wish, <laughs> I wish that it was like, oh yeah, it was all peaches and cream and everything went smooth. It was like, no, Come on. Come on. <laughs> you know, it was cause I grew up going to, to, to Catholic school. Okay. So I had mass on Fridays, mm. but then I went to a Baptist church on Sundays <laughs> and I was like, yo, this is, these two things are very drastically different to a point, Way different. to a point when I got to college, I'm like, I'm about to wall out. Like I'm not, I'm walking away from all of this. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I, I just, I don't want anything to do with this. And I tell people in college, when I started, I became a professional center. Like that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Cause to your point, how do you tell somebody who's 18, whose mind is still maturing? Yeah that okay i'm now you this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life yeah. like as long as you don't switch your major you can graduate in four years you're going to make this you're going to do this yeah you know and leave out the whole student loan aspect and you're going to come out with come xyz on. amount of come debt on. even you know what i'm saying it's like it's like okay no i switched my major like three or four different times i did it in five years you know yeah, yeah. similar to, similar to you and it's like how do you it's like god was like are you going to try me now it right. took my grandmother dying and then it took me almost one to take my own life wow. before I got serious because wow. I had one foot in and one foot out. That's real. 
And sometimes I really, you know, obviously God is not trying to harm us and do any harm, but I think sometimes he allows things in our life to say, look, I need you. I need you to see. Absolutely. This is what you asked for. I need you Mm -hmm. to see this. And it was like, okay, I I hit rock bottom before I got to him. So that's real. That's real. So no, I appreciate your transparency there. Preach transparency there. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fast forward just a little bit then. So when did you realize that that God had a pastoral call over your life, like because I know you said at certain points mm-hmm. I was partially in, partially out. Okay, mm-hmm. when did you realize like okay, not only that, it's time it's time to get serious about this because there's more to this than mm-hmm. even just going to church. More yeah. to this than okay, I've accepted Christ. When did yeah. you when did you realize man, it that? It's funny, man. Um, <laughs> I look back over my life and I see these um, the like these glimpses of God, like you know, and you know. And I remember talking a few occasions, right? Um, the last one is when I realized it, but a couple of things happened. I remember being in school, and um, every time I, I spoke in front of people um, to encourage them or to push them, I was always the one pushed up front. You know, if somebody needs to speak to the class, it's Deontay. If somebody needs to speak <laughs> at an assembly, it's Deontay. You know, um, I was in the scholarship program. Whenever someone needed to speak and represent the program, it's Deontay. And, you know, the freedom that I felt, not even so much the notoriety, believe it or not, like I felt free on the stage. Like I felt like I was supposed to be there. Mm. But here's the catch. I'm not a singer. I'm not a rapper. I'm not any of that. So, like, what is the stage for if you're not a singer or a rapper? Right. Right. Oh, it must be a speaker. But, you know, where I come from, motivational speakers just don't pop out of the blue. Um, so it's like, you know, I, I, yeah, I didn't know what that, I didn't know how to decipher those feelings. Um, but then, you know, as I continued to matriculate through high school and continue to kind of make bad decisions, I remember one night specifically, just for me to be transparent for real, um, I remember one night specifically, um, my, my buddies and I, we went out and we went on a robin spree, man. Mm-hmm. We, we kind of did whatever we wanted to do that day. And I had a great barber back then. I got a b- great barber now, too. Let's be very clear. But back then, I had a nah, different barber. Nah, I mean, you know, I mean, you may not, but you got a beard. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, might, yeah. you know what I mean? like, I can't connect. So. <laughs> um, but I had called my barber, man. It was like 11 o'clock at night, man. I called my barber and I asked him to get a haircut. His yeah. wife would always, like, be like, oh, if that's Deontay, let, like, go cut his hair. I right. don't care. So he met me at the barbershop, and i never forget, man, that was back when um, the Black Album came out, and uh, Jay-Z released, like, the concert you yeah. know, for the Black Album. I remember. And I'm in the barbershop getting my hair cut. Me and my barber, we watching the Black Album. We walk in. He locks the door. He put clothes. You know, people would knock on the door. 11 o'clock at night, people would knock on the door, and they'll be like, hey, let me in. He'd be like, no, I'm only cutting one dude. Right. Somebody else would knock on the door because they tried to get in. You know, they're like, no, no, you know, I'm only cutting this guy. And... uh I'm sitting there getting my hair cut, man. This guy, he comes, he pulls on the door, except the door opens. Hmm. So, of course, like, we're kind of, like, looking, like, okay, how did this guy get in? Right. Like, we just saw five people just walk by and, uh, and, and not have the ability to come through the doors. Comes in, man. He was clearly homeless, you know, you know, not looking great, not smelling great, whatever the case may be. And I'm sitting in a chair. We're all kind of, like, staring at each other. And he points at me and he says... You're a pastor. Ooh. And then he leaves out. Of course, like, it was a joke, right? Because I'm like, man, the route I'm going, man, I'm going to be in prison. Like, forget, like, being a pastor. My barber at the time was a Jehovah's Witness, so he's mm. like, ah. You know, right. people don't know what they're talking about. Um, fast forward, I go to school. I was an English major. I had a minor in education, so that's why I taught 12th grade and 9th grade English. Um, once I realized that wasn't for me, I went back. I got a PR minor. Um, I worked in advertising for a while, but now I'm in the, the world system, but at church, I'm still volunteering. Mm. And um, I taught the new members class of my church. It was called Salvation 101. And I taught the class, and it was probably no more than you know 10 people in the class. And after I got finished teaching that course and that class, um, I tell people, like, I went in my car, I had to drive back out to BW because I was still a student at BW. I got in my car um, and I cried. Like I just cried. Wow. Because I felt like at that time, I heard God say, I wanted you to teach, but not that way. Like I wanted you to teach this way. Mm. And so it was tough because now, similar to what we were talking about, this 18-year-old kid who had made this decision to get into English slash education and then switch over to advertising, 
It's like, what do I do now? Like, how do I actually make this come true? And so I just kept on serving. But I think that was the moment. It was after teaching my first like Salvation 101 class at my church. That's when I realized like I was made for this. Hey Amen. Come on. Like I was made for this right here. And I didn't know how I was going to get to this position right now. And it took a lot, brother, like a <laughs> lot of tears, a lot of pain, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. Um, but I'm I'm here, bro. So um, that's when I realized right then and there. Yeah. It's crazy how like God pieces things together that you're in a barbershop after doing something, after having yeah, a night like sure. that. A man walks in after the door is locked. For sure. And literally just tells you exactly who you are sure. in Christ. For sure. In the most, with a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> with a Jehovah Witness barber. Right. Uh, a a non-believing God, like, you know what I mean? And I just said I didn't believe in him. Um, you know, I remember giving my life to Christ, man, when I was, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I authentically believe I was saved then, like, no question about it. I remember the day like it was yesterday. Right. Um, and, but yeah, in that particular moment and season of my life, man, there was no church for me. There was no prayer for me. There was no devotion for me. There was no Bible for me. Right. Um, there was no tutelage for me in the Christian faith, like, not at all. Wow. Mm -hmm. how how differently do you think things would have been had you had that like had you have had that that ecosystem around that ecosystem around you just to be like all right we're going to keep you even further on we're going to keep you in this straight and narrow we're going to just just uh, i guess I, for lack of a better term discipleship right away uh, my life would be it wouldn't be what it is now see in most cases some people would say oh man, things would be better. Imagine if I didn't have to do this and I didn't have to do this and I didn't have to do this and I didn't have to do this, right? Um, pain gives you purpose. Come on. So if I didn't do the things that I've done, and, and of course I hate the people that I've hurt. Like, right. Right? I don't wanna, I, I hate that I hurt people in the past. I hate that I made decisions that, you know, caused conflict and strife between certain individuals. So, you know, that portion of my life, of course, I, I, I seek God for forgiveness. But if I did not do the things that I did and that I had done, if, if I hadn't gone through the things that I had gone through, then I wouldn't be the person that you see sitting here today. Come on. I teach out of the experience that I've had and I've encountered with God. So, you know, I can talk to people who come from the projects because I was in the projects. I can talk to people who came and lived in shelters because I was living in shelters. I can talk to people who were addicted, not just because I had a mother who struggled with addiction in some season of her life, but I struggled with addiction in some season of my life, right? So like I teach out of what I've experienced and that's why it's genuine. If there's any person that, you know, will talk to you about me, I'm not the greatest preacher. I don't I don't, I haven't mastered the pageantry of preaching. I, I don't, I didn't go to school um, my whole life for this. I didn't look up to, to, to preachers my whole life, none of the above. But when you hear me speak, my goal is to touch your soul Come on. the same way that God touched mine. Let's go. But I can only do that by telling you how much of a deliver, deliverer he was for me so that he can deliver you. Like how much he showed me mercy so that he can show you mercy. See how much he gave me grace so he will extend grace to you also. So if my life was perfect, brother, like I don't know what I would do. Um, I'm sure that God would use me, but I highly doubt that he would use me in the capacity that he's using me today because I am a culmination of my experiences in life and a culmination of my experience with Christ. We have a church up in here already. I, I, I respectfully disagree about your preacher <laughs> comment because I'm my spirit started jumping when you started talking. I'm trying to sit still right now. I'm trying, oh, to, but that's real because our testimony is is for someone else. Yeah, right. And you and I talked on the phone yesterday, and I was telling you how it is currently raining inside my kitchen right now. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a normal thing. It should not yeah, be yeah. raining in my house. Come on. But I was talking to my my best friend because he's a financial guru. We were talking just like. What's the best things to do? You know, you want to fill out the insurance claim. Do you want to take equity out the house? You know what I'm saying? What, what's, mm -hmm. what, what are my real options here? And I was like, I don't want any more debt. Yeah. I'm debt free. Finally, you know, wow, for the first time man. in my life, this like, crazy. like it, good stuff. bro. Okay. So this goes back to that whole 18 year old. Yeah. Not knowing you go to college, right? 
they take you to that um what's that thing like the it's not even a freshman orientation they take you outside to all the freshman activities and everything yeah, you got yeah, going yeah, on yeah, yeah. and what they got out there Those tables. It, the tables with a bunch of credit cards yep. that's just like oh you want this now here you go you can have you it you want a student credit card yeah. yeah i had one man i had one i just, i have zero credit cards right now yeah legitimately I only have one because I travel for a living for work. And if the worst should happen, yeah. either and my wife needs some or if I need to get back home, that's really sense. this is literally an emergency thing just now because I'm like the mafia, man. All yeah. cash. Yeah, you know I feel you. Saying? I like, feel you. I'll See, probably get pulled over at the airport type of situation. Yeah, I <laughs> you know, it's we can we can talk about that. I grew up listen, I grew up on the rappers too. This is um I'm trying to keep that for me on this episode. I, I've been talking about Jada Kiss too much on this podcast. So um but it, it's crazy because like he, he and I were talking, I said, I don't want any more debt. And he was like, yeah. I think that's wise. I said, because we used to be this way. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I couldn't say that if I didn't have the experience of spending money on things I didn't need, spending right. money on drugs, spending money on right. jewelry, spending money on nights out. And now it's mm -hmm. just like, no, if my whole philosophy now is if I can't buy it twice with cash, come on, I'm not paying for it. We don't I really need it. it. We don't. We don't need it because Jay Z says. So I mean, since we're talking about rap, no, we can go ahead. We can yeah, go. This is. We gonna keep this real. You can't buy it twice, man. You know what I mean? I don't that's think real. I knew he said that. <laughs> I don't think I knew he said that. So, so, I was a bigger Tupac fan. <laughs> Jay Z came in college because I got tired of getting in fights. So <laughs> Tupac can get you beat up. How did that? See, you see what happened? No, this, you, we we gonna keep it real on this podcast. Somebody, I can see the audience rolling their eyes right now, but that's all right. That's all right. But your, your testimony is an encouragement to other people. Praise God. Because God can use you to show them, no, if I can do this through him or I can do this through her, what makes you think I can't do this Come on. for you? Facts. You know what I'm saying? It is literally a walking encouragement. Facts. So, no, I give you, you in my notes right now, because one of my questions for you was going to be, how do you use your testimony in what you do as, as a pastor, as a teacher, as a preacher? And you, you nailed it. So, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate for sure. that. For sure. So, I don't want to. I don't want to miss the opportunity right now because we sitting inside a Remedy <laughs> Church. We sitting in it, yeah, for sure. And so you were a part of of this church plant team, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, man. We we started during the pandemic, man. So it, it's weird. It's a very extreme case, man. But I think out of that, God has blessed us extremely. Um, the way that we got here, um, short as I can give it to you, is. Um, I was serving at the church. I was always honest with my pastor, Dr. Vernon, um, and that's, that's my pastor for anybody who's watching. Dr. Vernon is my pastor, R.A. Vernon of the Word Church. Um, he taught me everything I know. Uh, he's taught me that you don't tell people who you over until you tell them who you under. That's fire. Um, I'm over the Remedy Church, but I'm under um, submission. And that's something that's lost in this culture. Um, everybody wants to do what they want to do. But I'll tell you now, if he called me right now, I will put this mic down, get in my car and go to wherever he want me to uh, go to just out of honor and submission. Um, but I have I, I told him that, man, I wanted to be a pastor and he thought I was joking. Um, because, of course, like in his head, he's like this young guy probably see me. I'm successful. I'm doing right. my thing. I'm on planes, trains and automobiles yeah. trying to figure out how to push the gospel of God. And um, and, you know, he probably is looking at that. He's like, nah, I know you know you're not. And I'm like, nah, I really believe this is what God wants me to do. Eventually, he sees the gift, man. And he says later on, he's like, all right, I'm a plant mark in 2019. That's the light church. Um, he has a campus in Akron and Youngstown. And then he said, I'm a plant you in 2020. Um, I'm going to plant you in 2020. I said, all right, sweet. Catch is the pandemic comes. Wow. My wife and I were supposed to go to Lorraine County, and uh, we had everything that we thought were situated, man. We went through leadership Lorraine County, which is kind of like the who's who of, like, professionalism um, in, that, in that space because our – call i believe is to bridge the marketplace and ministry um it's not just to stay secluded in the church but it's actually to go out um to, to judea and jerusalem and all the uttermost parts of the world right You're talking about heart gospel now. um so we we feel like we're we're called to do that type of ministry so we got into leadership lorraine county we found a school that we was going to start with we found a collective of people who i felt like was going to follow us man but then the whole world shut down um, I switched my role at the Word Church and I started doing some production stuff. And then during that season, um, while God was working on me, he was also working on my behalf. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had did a funeral. It was just when funeral homes started to open. I had did a funeral um, from, for somebody and um, I got a call from my pastor and he said, hey, come to my office, you and your wife. So I'm like, man, I'm about to get fired. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> 
Yeah, it ain't no question about it, man. You know, if the man tell you to bring your wife, like I'm like, yeah, I don't even like this doesn't make any sense. I don't man. even know what I did. Oh, we this is a wrap. Uh, now before the pandemic hit, I was the campus pastor for the Akron location for the Word Church. So I had done it now for like two and a half years. And so I go to his office and he sits and he, he's, 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 he's mumbling, he's fumbling. And if you know my pastor, he's very like articulate. He, he, he's well thought out, but in this, in this space, he's kind of like, you know, he's just kind of, he like, uh, you know, son, uh, I had to call you and tell you this now because uh, if, I, if I sit on it for one day, I, I, yeah, I, may have, I may change my mind. And I'm like, oh, okay, like what's going on? He's like, yeah, I, uh, I'm shutting down all my, uh, my, my campuses. And, uh, you know, I'm only going to have one campus. So I'm kind of looking at him like, all right, you're going to have one campus. Well, I'm in Akron. So what does that do to my job? Right. He's like, so you got to make a decision. I'm like, about what? He's like, the building out in Akron. If you choose to take on everything that it takes to run this building. Oh, wow. Tens of thousands of dollars a month, staff, so on and so forth. If you choose to take this on, then what we'll do is you rebrand, you do everything that you do, and you said you wanted a church called the Remedy Church, you can start there. Of course, that's major. A lot of people would say, um, well, you got a building. Like, no, I, I got a bill. Right. And this is something that, like, you really have to take into account. On top of that, I'm no fool. You know, however many people were coming to this space, you're going to lose 50 to 60% of them. That's right. Because they weren't called to me. They were called to him. So my wife and I, we sat on it for about a week. We came back and we said, let's do it. Um, from there, that was the end of October. He makes the announcement to the world the first week of November. So we're talking about like a week later. After we say yes, a week later, he tells the world that we're starting this church. Naivety told us that people would be in church in January 2021. Mm. So we make this announcement that we're starting first Sunday in January, not knowing that no butts would be in seats. Mm. So we started a virtual church, bro, for like four months, but people watched. They came, they followed. Um, the team, they just organically came together. I know you know Indy and, you know, it just everything was organic. That's what's up. India came, our team came around us. Once the split happened and we knew who was going to the Word Church and who was going to stay with Remedy, man, we rebranded, we redid everything that we were supposed to do. And we lost a lot, man. We lost a lot. But then in that season of loss, man, we gained a lot also. And so uh, we're in a position now where the church is doing well. It's caught a rhythm. And, you know, yeah, that's where we are, man. But we, we planted this thing with zero dollars in the bank, despite what some may believe or, you know, infer. But, yeah, zero dollars in the bank, man, everything that we have, it came, it came from those who have been committed to this ministry. Um, we had a crazy start. You know, a lot of people say started from the bottom. Now I'm here. I didn't start from the bottom. I can't lie. I had a great father who um, who saw enough in me to say, I think you can do this. And I know he had my back on the back end, but I'm proud to say that I never had to use that call. I never had right. to make that call and say, we're not going to make it this month. Or right. I'm not going to be able to, you know, do what you believe um, that I could do, man. And, and God is just God is just doing some amazing stuff in this church, man. Praise God for that, man. I, I lose my mind sometimes when people tell me how self-made they are. I'm like, so nobody so nobody helped you? Come on, man. Like, your mom didn't give birth Ain't to you? Ain't no such thing as like, self-made. Like, I don't even, I don't, like, it. it's just, like, I think that's one of those things that people started saying just because they heard somebody else say it. And it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cute, man. My, my brother and I, we were talking the other day, man, like, there's no such thing as self-made. Not at all. We're all community-made and we're all team-made. Even for the person who says, well, I got my PhD and ain't nobody helped me. You have professors. Right. Like, without the professor, you wouldn't have got the PhD. Talk to him. Without the person in the admissions office to help you figure out what classes you needed like no one in this world is self-made the way that this world is made is made for us to be interdependent mm -hmm. not independent right independent says that you don't need anybody when that's a blatant lie right like if you live in a house right now and you got lights that's because somebody downtown in your city can click a button to make sure your lights are on right like believe it or not they're attributing to some part of your success 
every person in this world is community made. Right. And the quicker you realize that you can't do things on your own, I believe the quicker your come up will be because everything that I do is attached to somebody. That's real. Everything that I do is attached to somebody. I wouldn't have these mic stands if it wasn't for Jaron Rose and India Burton, like them saying like, hey, we need mic stands for this, but it helps us do this. Like, you know, right. I wouldn't be in this building if at some point in time, Dr. Vernon back in 2000, whatever it was, said, man, like, I think this could be a church. He came in and he made this space a church, not with me in mind, but now I'm sitting here and everything that God has put into my heart and placed into my heart, we get to, you know, push out of this space in this place, man. We are all community made. That's I'm real. here because my mother made a decision, rather or not if it was a good decision or not a bad decision. I'm here because of her. Therefore, no one is self-made. We make a collective, we make a lot of decisions that can help us, but to say that no one is included or are a part of those decisions, I think that we, we kind of fall into a bad space. You said something else that was really good too about who am I under? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Before we, because I think sometimes people always like, they look at this as, as, as a, they see the person on stage and it's, it's like, okay, I want that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, but why do you want that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Facts. you don't know what's going on behind the scenes that those individuals have to go mm -hmm. through for what they have, for Facts. the call that God has on their life. Mm -hmm. There's a chance, and it's a good chance, they probably didn't even ask for that platform. Come on. They may have known the platform was coming, but they Facts. may have not been praying and asked for that. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a member of our church um, after, after church on Sunday, and I was just kind of giving them some, just some nuggets of truth. Like, I was just really just like, look, these are the things that, that I'm seeing and I think that we we really need to work on this, mm -hmm. you know. And it was like, man, this this is tough, you know. It was because it wasn't it was it wasn't one of those um, warm and fuzzy conversations. This yeah, was yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. love you enough to tell you X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And I said the only reason I can tell you this though is because in about a couple of days I'm gonna be on the other end of this phone conversation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm going to be on the other end of this because somebody is pouring into me. I answer to someone. Come on. I am a member of a church. So Come if on. you look at the bylaws of of, of Redwood, it matches almost word for word Come on. the church that I'm under. Same here. Like, I mean, I wouldn't have known how to write bylaws if I didn't have the template. <laughs> right. With you, brother. And they spell checked it for me. I'm like, I'm just about to copy and paste. This Come about on. to save me a whole lot of time. Come I'm already on. living it. So I... I didn't want to do, I come under that. Yeah. And I feel you. If my, my pastor has called me and I'm like, I'm on my way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or it's like, all right, let me, or I have to tell him, let me take this off your plate. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's, that's because the man, God used a man to change my life. Facts. You know, so. Same here, man. And to your other point, I mean, look at how they did it next. They sold everything come on. and did life and community together. Together. You know, so, and they, they look at how they were stronger because of it. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> you're only as strong as your weakest link. Come on. So it's, I, think you, I think you said a lot of good things there as far as like, look, we are in this together as yeah. a community. Yeah. And even that community part, it's someone is pouring to me. I'm pouring into someone else. Yeah. True. You know, so. Truth. Yeah. So I got to ask this question. Where did the name Remedy come from? Like, how did you, because you mentioned that he, that Pastor Vernon told you that you always wanted to have a church called Remedy. How, where did that name come from? Um, yeah, so one, my pastor, I'm, I'm putting it out there, uh, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm telling the world, my pastor did not like the name of our church. Um, I remember the first time I told him, he was like, yes, I just, it's just not it. I just, you know, I think you're going to get beat up on it. I'm, people are going to be like, yo, you think you're the Remedy? You think, which happens, right? And, and I knew it was going to happen. But I knew I felt what, you know, I felt like I knew what God wanted me to do. So funny story, man, my, my wife and I, I think I went somewhere to preach. I went somewhere to preach and um, there was a, I don't know if it was a college campus, if it was a, a conference, it, it, some of that stuff just get mixed up in my head. I just remember that there was like a young adult ministry or something called the something something remedy or the remedy something 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 and I just remember hearing the word remedy mm -hmm. and I looked at my wife and she looked at me at the same time and I'm like remedy she was like remedy I'm like remedy <laughs> we got in the car that night and was like the remedy church I'm like I like it that's what's up. I'm like, you like, you like. And we prayed on it. And, and for me, I always wanted to build with my wife. Um, I don't leave this place alone. Come on. When my wife go out, 
when she goes out, she says, my name is Pastor Lisa. I'm the lead pastor of the Remedy Church. When I go out, I say, my name is Pastor Lav. I'm the lead pastor of the Remedy Church. Um, because she's not just a co-pastor. She's not just a co-leader. Um, and I know that co just means collaborative, man. But co has dropped the importance of so many positions that we just choose not to use co-pastor and co-leader and all that other stuff. No, we're lead pastors here. And so once my wife was on board, and that's pretty much anything in my life, I'll mm -hmm. be honest with you. If I have my wife on board, brother, I mean, I feel like I can conquer the world. Come on. So, you know, my wife said yes to the remedy church. I said yes to the remedy church and that's all we needed. So even when we brought it before my pastor, like, and then of course we prayed on it and we felt like we had confirmation from God. So when I brought it to my pastor and he said, I don't like it, it wasn't that I wanted to be disobedient, but I knew that I wanted to be more obedient to Christ. And then on top of that, I also wanted to be more obedient to my wife, the one that I feel like God um, willed me to. So yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's good. What are some of the, what's the mission statement? What's the mission or values of, of the Remedy Church? Um, so, man, our, our mission is very, very simple, man. We just want to love people like Jesus Christ. There you um, go. You look at that on the website. That's literally what it says, man. You know, the church, the Remedy Church is here to love people like Jesus. Um, the core values, we, we hold three things aloft and we say it, we repeat it at services. I feel like if you ask anybody who is attached to our church, they should be able to tell you is uh, we love Christ, we love people, and we build community. There you those go. three things if anything that we do doesn't fall under those category then we're doing something wrong come on loving christ first loving people second building community um, and loving people is second because we have to love people enough to convict them and to help them change uh, we have to love people to encourage them to go to their next step and their next level and then after you love on people in that way then I believe that the community that you want to see starts to be built out of um, out of that that mindset. It's important. Like when I started Redwood, it's important to have the mission and the vision down mm -hmm. because then you can build backwards. Yeah. You can build everything from there because Facts. you have that's the foundation. Mm -hmm. But it's also the goal. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we can work from the goal and the foundation. Yeah. Because now anything that we're doing outside of the mission or the vision statement, we can immediately put an ax to as soon as we can fit. You, you can see when you get out of whack when you start, when you stick to the mission and the vision. For sure, for sure. You know, our whole thing with, with Redwood is we inspire followers of Jesus who then turn around to inspire others to follow Jesus. Come on. The vision is be the church. Come on. So if it's anything outside of that, dead it, yeah, quick. I agree. Dead it, quick. I agree. So, appreciate it. So I got, this is more of a personal question for okay, me to go understand. For it. So, Whatever you want to know. How hard, like, I don't know, I've never planted a church. Mm -hmm. So, and I appreciate the transparency about the budget. How mm -hmm. hard is it to budget a, a church plant? Like, what, what goes into something like that? So, man, you know, this is, this is what I'll say. I'm not qualified to answer that question. Okay. I'll give you what happened to me, uh, but I'll tell you what I'm not good at. No, I'm I appreciate not qualified that. at all to answer that question. I'm going to tell you why. It's because what we did was probably against every church planning manual. But I'm not saying that to boast. See, some people say that they're boasting, like, oh, you know, what we did, nobody would have said we could have made it, and this is why you should yeah. do it this way. <laughs> I would never tell a person to plant the way that I planted. Right. Um, because we planted with lack of understanding and lack of resources and lack of support. Mm. I mean, there are great organizations out there. Uh, truth be told, my wife and I are actually a part of ARC, um, Association of Related Churches, um, even as a church that's already existing because they've systematized things that some people are guessing about. Mm. Um, so when you start talking about budgeting and things like that, I would give you to individuals who probably know more. Got it. Um, and there are networks out there um, that will help you um, plant and go to another level. In our experience, it, everything was hard. Mm. Because we didn't know some of those things were even available. Yeah. But God gave us favor. So in our case, um, we, when we started doing our, you know, in the church planning world, it's like interest socials. For us, it was like volunteer training, right? When we started doing our volunteer training, we had like 100 people show up, 150 people show up. And so for us, we were just like, well, we want y'all to start tithing here. 
if this is your church and I'm your pastor, like start tithing to the church. So we started that at the top of November. <laughs> So at the top of November, they started sending their tithe and that many people who were committed to the call then allowed us to like substantially impact the bank account. And then from there, we went out and did what we needed to do in order to sustain the ministry. That's not the route that a person should take because rarely will you find that many committed people. You have to understand I was the campus pastor here, so they right. knew me already. They loved my wife and I, my family. They knew, um, you know, part of the vision and which means we started a church with church folks mm. which made it so much easier i didn't have to convince them and tell them the benefit of tithing right um i didn't have to convince them and tell them the benefit of serving so in my case that portion of my life was a little bit easier than most church plants um, because most church plants are literally starting from the ground up grassroots and just trying to figure that out i had it a little bit easier in that category. Where I didn't have it easier was the responsibilities that came with taking and assuming responsibility for something this large into this magnitude. Um, that's where I am grossly um, out of perspective of like most most church planners. I appreciate the honesty, man. So. What what it, I guess, what advice then would you give to someone who's looking to plant a church? Like if I told you, Find I'm about to go. Find a place that will help you plant churches. And this is not, and don't, and don't do your pastor a disservice and force him or her to do something they've never done. See, because most people want to plant a church and they go to their pastor, which they should do. That's the first person that they should go to. Um, but then they rely on their pastor to plant them. And let's say that their pastor has no experience in planting. So their pastor is going to do everything that they believe that they should do. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Uh, give you uh, $30,000 to help you start or uh, help you. Um, um, how do I? And so there are actually people out there who will help you start a church. And they don't want anything from you other than to impact the kingdom of God. Um, and Ark is one of those places. I'm not a walking poster board but i've seen their model um flourish i've seen people take advantage of that model and so for me even we didn't get on with arc until we were already a year old mm. by every church metric after a year we were killing the game um i'm just being honest with no, you man real. we had hundreds of members joining we have hundreds of people watching online we had people joining all across the country but then there was something that i saw and that something was the ceiling. I saw the ceiling approaching. I, we didn't hit our ceiling, but I saw the ceiling approaching and I realized that the ceiling was only approaching because I had a lack of knowledge. So I found someone who had that knowledge, which was this organization, and they helped us you know, reformulate some of the things that we thought was law and we realized that it was actually something that was very flexible. But find a place, the CMN Network, that's another place that plant churches. Um, um, Exponential, I believe that that's another organization that plants churches. Um, there are so many church planting organizations, I would say find them and find them quick uh, because they have the steps that you need in order to like push your ministry to another level. A lot of times when people are coming to me for any kind of counsel or any kind of guidance or just any 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 discipleship, one of the things I tell them, find somebody who's where you're trying to get to yeah. and 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 spend time with them. Yeah. Because they can tell you what to do. Yeah. And sometimes more importantly, they can tell you exactly what not to do. Yeah. Like this that crazy thing when people say, you know, experience is the greatest teacher. That's a lie. The greatest teacher is a person who actually went through it. So you can take 20 years and experience something so you can say you taught yourself right or you can find somebody who actually went through it already and you can say how do i avoid the pitfalls that you actually went through you know so you know it, it, it grieves me when i hear people say things like well i just need to find my own way no you need to find somebody who went that way and they'll tell you what's down that road you know what i mean like oh i just need to figure it out on my own no you don't get with somebody who in some way figured it out so that you don't have to hit your head on the same things that they hit their head on so i'm constantly on the phone with my mentors i'm constantly on the phone with my big brothers in the faith i'm constantly on the phone with my father in the faith i'm constantly on the phone with those who can pour into me so that you know i can be more successful 
um, in this pursuit of impacting the world for Christ? This is where people get mad at me because mm -hmm. they'll be like, oh, you're getting ready to do this. I have experience in it. What does that mean? Experience has to be evaluated to exactly mm -hmm. your point. I mm -hmm. need to evaluate Absolutely. this. Like, Tom Brady's the greatest quarterback of all time. That's mm -hmm. what they say, right? That experience does not affect me. Come on. <laughs> That's not going to help me plant a church. Come on, real. That's real. Being able to throw a pass 70 yards downfield has no impact on what I'm trying to do with my on. life. Like, you, experience has to be Come evaluated. On. And sometimes people get mad when you when your experience isn't relevant to what I'm trying to accomplish. Exactly. Yeah, it's very true. And so I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, very true. You know, very it's true. it's important to have people in your life like, hey, look, I did this mm -hmm. and I did it this way. Yeah. Kind of what you said about the, you should actually go here because I went here and this is everything that happened. Come on. Come on. You know, I so when you get around people like that, the conversation is higher. It's a whole the, level. It's a, there's, there's a certain level of, there's always that saying that successful people won't let you fail. Come like, on. because the conversations that they're going to have are literally going so, to be it's, it's avoiding either those pitfalls mm -hmm. or telling you if you go this route, these are your options and this is what could, could Agreed. happen. Agreed. You know, so it's, you have to be able, you have to get in a room with those folks. Agreed. And find them. And some of them, they want, I, I don't even want to say want some, to a lot of them, the majority of people they I come in contact want. to want to help. The majority. I found very few and that And here's don't. the issue. It's not that they don't want to give you the answers. It's just that people are in this mindset where they feel like they shouldn't have to ask. Nothing is given in this world. Right. Man. And we, we, we have this generation and this culture where you feel like everything should be given. No, you need to open up your mouth and ask. Um, it's not my job to assume what you need. It's your job to tell me what you need. Um, and I'll tell you this. Every time I've opened up my mouth and I've asked for help, I've received it. And every time I assumed that somebody was supposed to help me, I didn't. So every time I opened up my mouth, they gave me the, kings to the, the keys to the kingdom. And every time I assumed that they were going to give me the keys to the kingdom, they didn't because they didn't know that that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I we have to open up our mouth and be okay to ask. I think to that point, because I do major gift fundraising for a living. Mm -hmm. So I ask people for a million dollars or more mm -hmm. for, 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 university, for mm -hmm. the university I work at, right? Closed mouths don't get fed. Facts. At some point, you're going to wonder why we're constantly meeting. At some point, mm -hmm. I have to get to the point where I'm going to ask. Absolutely. You know, and I think that it's important that sometimes people actually don't. Sometimes there's what you say. Mm -hmm. But if you have a pastor and mentor, sometimes they can listen to what's coming off your, your, your mouth, but then mm -hmm. they can hear what the heart is Facts. or isn't saying. Facts. So sometimes having somebody who can read that situation is also good, too. So to, to that point, to, to, to that effect, I want to go into the going a little deeper here. So okay, go because for it, man. sometimes and I think you've probably you've probably experienced this too. Mm -hmm. People want to get behind the winner. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Like they they see they see the success and they're mm -hmm. like I want to get on with that. Absolutely. They liking the photos now. Now they're sharing everything. Mm -hmm. They 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 like things that are going well. Yeah, absolutely. But they may not want to have the late nights and the early mornings. Mm -hmm. They not want they may not want to help clean the bathrooms mm -hmm. they not want to they may not help change the diapers in in the kids wing in, mm -hmm. in the nursery area right what are some what was something or some of those things that no one saw you going through while you were doing this like what were some of those like those painful moments like what what was that like anything you want to share there man you name it bro uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, this might be the rest of the it, show <laughs> you name it man uh i mean my pastor always says this a leader without followers is just taking a walk that's real um so um, you know, I appreciate everybody that follows, mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? People may say, oh, they just Instagram followers, or you right. just got, you know, people sitting down and they'd rather come to church, but they don't want to serve. Uh, we need them. Yeah. Like, we need them. Like you said, um, people want to move with what's moving. Um, and if you're not moving, then you don't get the attention of those um, that you want to get, you know, the attention of. So it's like, no, that's major, man. But then there is a level of sacrifice um, as a CEO, as a president, as a lead pastor, as a senior pastor, as a whatever you call yourself as the top guy or top girl. It's like, man, like, no, nah, there are sacrifices that people don't know about. I remember, man, like being at my house. I used to live in Berea. When we learned that we were taking, um, that we were going to start the Remedy Church here, um, 
I was living in Berea. That's an hour away from here. Yeah. 55 minutes there and then 55 minutes back. That's two hours of my life that was on the road every single day. But I remember when we knew we were going to take this place and we were like getting prepared for for um, getting prepared for uh, our first volunteer meeting. And it dawned on me at like 10 o'clock at night that the sanctuary wasn't vacuumed and things like that, man. So I told my wife, I'm like, man, you know, I got to go to the church and I got to vacuum this place because I haven't built up leaders enough that would think like this early. I used to be out here, man, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. My family, my kids would be out here. My wife and I used to clean the toilets um, before people came into this space. Um, and I know people, you know, look at us now and, you know, assume what they want to assume, man. But we on the grind. Like, I st I'm still up here 40 hours a week. Like, Absolutely. you know what I mean? And, and it's not just writing sermons and studying, man. You can ask our lead deacon, Lorenzo, um, and, you know, our director of ministries, Stacy, man, Minister Stacy. Like, man, I'm grinding. They're trying to take my hands off of it. You go on our social media platform, some of those flyers and promos, like, I was creating while I was sitting down in my office at home. Um, you know what I mean? Like, no, nah, the grind never stops. And so for the people who believe that once you ascertain a certain position that it gets easier, no, nah, man, the devil is alive, man. I'm doing the most work I've ever done in my life. That's but real. it's the most fulfilling work I've ever had in my life. This is legitimately grind season. If you know anybody that knows me, they know uh, my hands are going to stay dirty. Uh, right. My hands are going to stay dirty. Um, and that's just the grind in me. Um, I tell people I'm a pastor nominally, but I feel like I'm a deacon in my heart. There you go. <laughs> that was my favorite position at the church. Um, ask anybody that's seen me come up in ministry. I enjoy moving the chairs. Like, I'm not like this, not like this isn't just to like sound fake. Like I enjoy I moving you. the chairs. I enjoy vacuuming. I enjoy being the first one to open up the doors and turn the alarm off. I enjoy showing up when nobody else showed up. I enjoy standing in the rain and getting people out of their cars with umbrellas. I enjoy being in the parking lot. I enjoy being at events before five hours before everybody and five hours after everybody. I enjoyed it. And it was my heart to see the ministry go to another level, overflowing into my heart to see now people go to another level, but all also the actual church to go to another level um so yeah man i i can i can give you countless amount of things man that my wife and i have done that nobody will give us credit for but jesus man but that's the only credit that we need shepherds are supposed to smell like sheep come on man so how do you tell people get in the mud and you clean come on how do you tell people to get in the mud and you ain't muddy with them come on bro i love the church I have fun at church. Come on. And I will tell you, if you look at, and I mean, actually, you, you, this just happened to you last night. Like, Come on. what time did you get this email with the question? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, uh, you're right. And that's then facts. what time did we get here? Come on, that's <laughs> here. facts. That's facts. Like, I, you, you came in, you said, did you look at the questions? I said, man, you sent the questions at 1 o'clock in the morning, brother. I was asleep. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got here at 8.30, 9 o'clock, trying to set everything up, man. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's the, that's the grind, right, though. right. Like, if you want to be successful, that's the grind. That's the call, man. When I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. When I'm on you. sabbatical, I'm on sabbatical. But when it's grind mode, it's grind mode. See, because here's the reality, man. It's not just my life on the line anymore. It's not just my life on the line anymore. We pay a lot of people here. It's their families on the line right, right. now. We right. have a goal to do so many more things in the city of Akron and in this world, in this nation, man. Like, it's so much more on the line right now, man. So, like, if, if, it, if it needs to get done, if I'm the person that needs to get it done, then, then so be it. Then so be it. And I only want people around me who are attached to the vision, who can follow me and not question every move that I make because I'm going to do some crazy stuff, but that's because I want to get crazy results and that's because I have crazy faith. Right. I feel you. I feel you. I think in leadership, something else, like I don't look around to see who's going to do it, mm -hmm. especially if I haven't coached them and trained them on how to do mm -hmm. it. I'm going to show you mm -hmm. because I have literally preached on Sundays and then clean the bathrooms the next week, mm -hmm. you know, and don't care. Mm -hmm. I have I have held other people's kids while they're going on stage to get honored for things. Yeah. And their kids in the back throwing up on me. Yeah. That, that particular kid didn't like me. But yeah. that's but yeah. that's so that's, that's a unique story. But um, I love it. Sometimes yeah. I'm just, I'm with you. Sometimes I'm in that ground like there's no place I'd rather be. But if I'm not going to do it, 
I can't get mad when results don't come. Yeah, facts. And if I'm not going to train them up on how to do it, I can't get mad at the results when they're not doing certain things. Man, we got a motto, man. You do it, you teach it, you watch them. That's real. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, for me now, granted, you know, I will be honest, you know, in the next five years, there are some things that I probably won't do. Um, yeah, it's just the truth. Right. You know, as I continue to mature my pastoring and mature my leader, my leadership, yeah, I, <laughs> like, I put it like this. Let me also be honest with you. The same toilets that I said I was cleaning before people came in here, I, don't, I can't tell you the last time I cleaned the toilet. Right. You know I what I'm saying? You. But I will tell you that my leaders know I will. Right. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, there are certain things that now in my, in my space and pastoring, there are some things I don't have to do, but I am willing to do anything that um, needs to be done in order to get the kingdom moving. Um, so, yeah, you do it, you teach them, and then you watch them um, because that's how you multiply leaders. Hmm. I'm going to ask this question directly, even though I know you've already touched on it. What are you passionate about? Oh, man. So I tell people like this, man, when it comes to preaching and teaching, um, I do it for the light bulb. Like, it's like a cartoon for me. Like, yeah. when I'm up there, you ever seen those cartoons and a person or one of those, like, the coyote realizes, like, something and it's like, and then you like, it's like this eureka moment. Bro, I'm that's a- what I teach for, bro. <laughs> like, that's what I teach for. I love Looney Tunes. I was watching them on, on Saturday, man. man. I was so watching them on like, Saturday. <laughs> so it's like, that's what I teach for. Right. Man. When I'm up there preaching, I'm waiting for that moment. Mm. I'm waiting to convict the believer and the unbeliever. Mm. Like, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for something to click in their spirit and just like, oh, snap, he loves me. Mm. Oh, snap, like, there's another way. Oh, snap, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, snap. Like, like that right there is something I can never, ever, like, replace, man. Like, it's something that, like, it it drives me. So I'm in this thing to see lives change. But then that also comes through different mediums, right? I love helping people, man. Right. That's what's I up. I legitimately love helping people, man. You know, man, give me some money, man. I'm going to give some away. That's real. You know, somebody just gave me some money the other day. My wife and I were at the house this morning. Matter of fact, not, not, not the other day. It was this morning. I was leaving the house. My wife and I we were talking about money. And she said, yeah, you gave that, that woman a generous tip. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's who we are. I love helping people. So, you know, people look at our church and say, man, you guys probably do too much, man. We've given away thousands and thousands of shoes. We've given away thousands of book bags. We've helped thousands of people. And I mean it. Like, this ain't no exaggeration. This ain't the pastor exaggeration. No, we've legitimately helped thousands of people in one event. So this ain't a culmination of thousands of people. No, we're right now, we're at tens of thousands of people when you start adding the impact that the Remedy Church has had over the course of our two year existence, man. Like, and people may say, I go on a deep end when it comes to outreach, but I don't care. I don't care. I don't think I'll go wrong by helping people. I don't think that I'll ever get smitten when I'm helping people. I believe that God is smiling on me. Now, I do believe that there's a level of discernment and a level of wisdom so that you don't exasperate all that you have. Because if we're both in a ditch, who's going to pull you out of it, right? right? But there is a place where I believe the threshold where it's like, no, this is the most you can do and operate there. Because if you give that all in the natural i'll put my super on top of that and that's where we get supernatural so i'm I'm going for it so i'm the outreach pastor in new life church okay so i oversee all of our community outreach efforts Mm -hmm. and you have to show people that you love them come on man they can't we can't just walk into a building on sunday and then walk right back out they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care that's real and it's it's crazy because we don't we're, I'm revamping the ministry now to, to really go hard after the souls, to really go hard after just leading people to Christ. But we're not going to stop our, some of our community outreach events and efforts that we do because the people still need that. There's Facts. actual needs. Again, they sold everything and met the needs of the community. Facts. The community in Lakewood has needs, and I'm aware of those needs. Mm-hmm. So am I not going to do anything about it? Come on. That makes me part of the problem. Come on. And if the leader is part of the problem, the whole ministry is about to collapse now. Facts. Because if, if the person who oversees the ministry is the problem, yeah. what's going to, the trickle down effect of that is not only going to affect the people who are following me, it's going to affect the community. Yeah. 
So Agreed. we got to get out there and again get muddy with him. You need shoes? Let's make this happen. You need school supplies? What is that? I like, agree. okay, is this is what does the community need from us so they can see yep. the love of Jesus? Yeah. So they can actually see it for themselves. Like, why is this stranger helping me? Because mm-hmm. I love you. That's Come it. On. That's real. That's real. Man, we've walked the streets and done things, and people are just like, "Let me, let me pay you for this." I'm like, no, we didn't. We don't need. We didn't. We, we didn't. We didn't come that for. They're like, "You serious?" I'm like, "I'm dead serious. I'm dead." No, put that away. We just want to tell you, Jesus loves you today. That's it. Come on. Nothing else. Agreed, man. I still, I, I believe that that's the right way. So we sitting here with this mm-hmm. built to last banner behind yeah, me. Man, like, so t- we t- grind yeah, right let's talk now. to us. Talk to us what this is about. Tell us. Man, built to last is a uh, vision campaign um, that we're that we're having at the church. Um, you know, man, I, I've come to the conclusion, man, is that um, people will follow you if, they, if you give them the right vision. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a, a, a concretized vision but it has to be a clear vision Mm -hmm. if there's anything that our members and our constituents and those who believe in like what we do they know that we love people um they know that we want to do right by people and that's the vision that they need um and so this built to last campaign being completely transparent this building that we that we're sitting in right now it comes at a high price uh, a very high price uh, a price that most church planners probably would want monthly we mm-hmm. have to pay in bills right and um the reality is is that i want something more solid for our ministry and we can't get that footing here mm-hmm. um we've we're dealing with a a very disgenuine ownership and you know so on and so forth man and so uh we wanted to buy this building and it's no longer up for us to buy and so now we say well what are we going to do next like what's our next move and um i really believe that god is pushing us out of this space as great as this space is um somebody bore witness to me not too long ago they said this is just a glimpse of god's glory come on so you think that this is it but this is just a glimpse of his glory um and i believe that there's something greater on the way here um but in order for us to get to that greater i'm always honest with people we need resources Mm -hmm. um the reason why the remedy church can do what we do is because um we're in a position where we're not over resourced but we're resourced enough that we don't have to depend on anything other than the people who walk through these doors um, and that is something great to say as a pastor That's real. Um, of an organization such as this. Um, so I told our team, man, we need to raise a lot of money, rather if we buy or if we build, whatever it is, our next level is going to require a lot of money. Um, and I put out the Built to Last vision campaign and people jumped on board. And just to talk to you about collaboration and just to talk to you about surrounding yourself with people who will push you to another level. In my context, I have never asked anybody for, you know, you're used to it, right? You ask people for a million dollars. I've never asked people for probably more than a thousand dollars in my life Mm -hmm. um, to give to a church, me personally. Um, I came from a larger ministry, but I can't even really recall them asking anybody for more than maybe four thousand or five thousand dollars. As I was getting ready for this um, campaign, I had a person come to me and say, "Um, I think you should ask somebody for $10,000. And I said, man, you're absolutely crazy. Like, I'm I'm, I'm lucky if I can get all these people to bring $1,000 in one week. Um, They said, no, ask. And I felt crazy doing it, but here it is. They were proven. They were proven. Come on. So I did exactly what they told me to do. I put $10,000 on this sheet and I said, hey man, check what you wanna give. And that first week we had multiple people say, well, we're giving 10,000. We had multiple people say they're giving five. We had multiple people saying they're giving 1,000. We had multiple people saying they're gonna give $50. Multiple people that said they can only give $20. Whatever their gift was, man, it was appreciated. But I'm telling you now that I would have never pushed myself to that level less I had tutelage in some type of area, just kind of going back and backtracking and some of the stuff that we've talked about. So Built to Last is a vision campaign and that vision campaign is going to fuel our next level right um because this is not the um this space is not the definition of who we are as a church um we want to do way more things than this building allows us to do that's right um and fact of the matter is is that at some point 
we're going to have to shift and make some moves. I'm actually going to do a leadership podcast on here soon. Mm-hmm. And I want to get a panel of people. And I would love to have you back for that. Because oh, man, I would be we, honored. This is one of the things that, that I talk to when I'm training up leaders. Mm-hmm. And because I talk about it, I have to be very cautious to make sure I'm living it, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Facts. If the leader doesn't know where they're going, the whole thing is about to bottom out. Oh, my gosh. Because now you got literally the blind leading Leading people who are trusting you. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know. Leaders have to state the vision clear and plain. They have to know. You have to know where you're going. And and here it is. And then. But I'm also echo. I'm also kind of rebuttal that. People have to trust their leaders, too. That's real. See, because the leader can know where they're going, but then a leader knows when I can give this information out. When you read Nehemiah, Nehemiah has this assignment. The assignment is to build up the walls of Jerusalem. At night, he goes out and he surveys the land, but he only goes out with three people. Mm -hmm. So it's him, a donkey, and three other guys, right? So he goes out there, he surveys the land, And he comes back. He never tells the people what he saw, but they have to trust that whatever he saw and whatever his vision is, that is going to come to pass, even though they may not know all the details. That's real. You have to give people enough to move. Exactly. But you cannot give them all um, of the information up front, right? Because certain people can only handle certain things. Exactly. And what Nehemiah saw, he saw something in ruins, but he saw the vision of it going up. If he would have allowed some of those people to see it, it would have served as discouragement. So for those who have leaders that they trust, trust their leadership, allow them to to lead you the proper way. Um, allow, you know, Paul says, I got the scars to prove it. Like, follow me. Like, mm-hmm. I've, I've gone through this thing enough that I'm going to get you through also. Um, So yes, a leader needs to know where he's going or she's going, but then the people need to, they need to trust their leader enough to know that they know where they're going, even if they're not given all the information in one WAP. That's real. Because that goes to the fact that the leader has to know the people who are following them. Absolutely. Because, okay, if I tell you this, what is the impact going to be? Yeah. But this is why the leader also has to be surrendered to Christ. I need the Holy Spirit to tell me, help me with this. Yeah. Before we walk in this meeting, what exactly do I need to share? Yeah. What exactly do we need to put? It's not for the sake of not being transparent and honest. It's about, okay, this could really, because some people, they, you have to be very careful who you let in onto your vision and your idea. Come on. I think I said this when, when Indy and I were were sitting down, you know, you have this idea, just like a child. You're not just going to leave anybody with your child. Come on. You know what I'm saying? You're not just going to tell everybody every single, every little thing all the time. Nope. You know, you you at some point have to use wisdom Come on. in speech. Come and on. sometimes there's wisdom in silence. Come on. So, and sometimes you just have to know our Holy Spirit prompt me of what to say and how to say it. Absolutely. You know, so. No, that's good. So that is a huge undertaking. Right? That's, that's, oh, this I've that's, never done. Like, put it like this. One, I've never done it and I've never been a part of something like this. Right. Like, so even in my past church experience, man, I've never done a campaign to this degree. Um, so God is absolutely doing some new things um, in, in our lives when it comes to this, this campaign. How do you, because you and I both know you cannot pour out of an empty cup, mm-hmm. right? How do you stay filled up? How do, you, how, do you, how do you keep doing that knowing that, okay, we planted this church and we're doing well. We're getting the vision to to move out this building does not let us do everything we want to do Mm -hmm. how do you stay filled up knowing you have to pour so much out and then know you got your hands in so Um, much i think that's intentional i think that's time with god that's time with mentors and your pastor that's time with brothers who will keep you lifted Mm -hmm. um that's time with individuals who are experiencing the things that you lack experience in um so i think that that's subjective to anybody but that's how i stay that's how i stay poured and and filled up Um, my wife is very instrumental in that category um as far as like just praying for me and you know giving me wisdom and you know finding those discerning moments that she sees that we need to shift and things of that that space and in that nature man so that's how I stay filled up. I stay filled up by surrounding myself with people who are better than me, who are smarter than me, um, who are more successful than me, um, so that if I ever get down, they're like, hey, we've been here before, and uh, I'm going to coach you on the way out. Yep. If you're always the smartest person in the room, there's a you problem. You're in the wrong room. And you, 
that big fish in the small pond thing, Come that's on. when you start cracking that ceiling. Come like, on. you know what I mean? That's when you start floating to this, like, I need yeah. to change. I need yeah. to change here. Facts. You know? So, something else I talk to people a lot about, and I want to get your perspective on this, too. Mm-hmm. When no one's looking and no one's around, I tell people, like, that's who you really are. That's who you are. Like, I was when, just preaching that, man. When, see, I'm going to need to go back and watch that. When, when no one is around, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you watching? What are you listening to? Mm-hmm. That's, that's who you are. Mm-hmm. How important is it to make Christianity a lifestyle? How important is it that you're on the stage, but this is what I'm doing off the stage? This is what I'm doing when no one's looking. This yeah. is what, how important is that? So I taught a message titled Building with Silent Stones. Mm. And um, the idea is what are you doing in the dark? Like what are you building in the dark? Because once the light comes on, like what you built or what you've built is going to be revealed to the public. That's real. Um, And you can fake for a long time, man, when nobody's watching, but when people start watching, you can't fake any longer. Um, The reason why Christianity should be a lifestyle is because that's going to be the greatest thing that are, that's going to get individuals to change and turn their life to Christ. Um, We live in a world where people need an example. As much as we want to sit here and say word should be it, word without deed and without proof, man, is something that um, seems to fall on deaf ears and and shallow ground. Um, I believe that many of us, we've turned more hearts to Christ based on them seeing us go through it, live through it, love through it honor God through it, like that's a lifestyle. Christianity is a lifestyle. Hence why it's something that you should protect. Um, It's something that you should cherish enough to say, how would this affect the brand of Christianity? You know, we get into these conversations about what's wrong and right in life. Um, Like I, I leave those conversations now, I say, what will affect the Christian brand and the Christian lifestyle? That's what's most important to me now. Um, That's what's most important. So um, will my wife and I drink a glass of wine when we go out? Yeah, we will together. Would you ever see me honestly drink a glass of wine in a public setting with somebody outside of my wife? You will never see me do that. And that's not even an exaggeration. You you. will never see me do it. Because I have to protect the lifestyle and the brand of Christianity. Um, Will you see me go to a bar? I don't even sit at the bar. Like if I go to Applebee's right now and they say all we have are bar seats, do you want to go eat your appetizers up there? The answer is no for me. I don't even want anybody to see me sitting at a bar and get what I'm doing misconstrued, not because of me and not because I'm doing something wrong. Right. It is because it's an attack to the lifestyle. I hold the Christian lifestyle above the personal lifestyle that I claim I want to live. That's real. And I think that that's the issue with a lot of people. Your life is the depiction of, of what you believe, and I believe him more than anything else in the world. So when you see my, my Instagram page, I'm very careful about what I, what I post. I post Jesus and my family. I don't even post my, I don't even post my opinion. I don't, I don't post my opinion. Why don't you post your opinion, Pastor Live? It is because my opinion is not truth, and people follow me because what they want to see is truth. That's real. Like, that's why people follow me. Yes, I'm genuine in everything that I post, but I don't post everything that I just feel like saying. I don't post and talk about political parties and so on and so forth. I talk about the wrongs that are happening to, you know, the the marginalized, absolutely. But when we start talking about who to vote for and what to do, who I like and who I dislike, man, that's not for me to do that. And I'm talking about particularly me. Some people do. They want a more opinionated um, profile, but for me, everything centers around the lifestyle of um, Christianity and how I represent God in everywhere that I go. I really respect what you said there because I'm going to use this as an example. I'm a big fan of MMA, I'm a huge mm-hmm. fan of the UFC, and the pay per view prices just went, they went through the roof like a couple years ago. <laughs> like they went imagine. through the roof. Like I used to order every single pay per view. Mm-hmm. I used to get them all just because I, I enjoy the art of mixed martial arts. Like I, yeah, yeah, I enjoy yeah. just dissecting everything that, that they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Like I enjoy watching it. 
when those pay-per-view prices went up, stop buying them. Mm. And everyone's like, you can go here to watch it. You can go here. This, this bar has it. This has it. Yeah. I said, I'm not going to do that. Come on. And they said, why? And I said, you know, this, and this gave me an opportunity to share something about myself, but it also gave me to share, to, to, to tell them like, this is not a good image. This is not a good look yeah. for what I profess that I believe. Come on, man. The idea of me walking out of a bar. Come on, man. At one or two o'clock in the morning. Come on. With sm- other drunk people. Smiling and laughing. Because you don't know that Stipe just knocked out Alistair over him. Come on. You don't know that I actually don't drink at all. Come on. You don't know that I have an addictive personality because due to drugs. No, not due to drugs and alcohol, but I, I have an mm-hmm. addictive personality, which led to a lot of drug and alcohol abuse. Yeah. That I would just rather watch it in my house. I'd rather watch it at home, man. Because that, or I walk out of there crying because my favorite fighter just got knocked out, right? Okay. You don't know <laughs> that I'm not six or seven shots deep. Right. You, that I'm, you right. just, you have no idea that I'm not, no that I'm just idea. being overly emotional for no reason. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, That's real. I just don't even put myself in the environment. That's good. It's not religious. It's not legalism. No. It's wisdom it's just from wisdom, man. where I used to be, Come on. where I'm at now, and where I'm trying to go. Come on. Because wisdom outranks right and wrong. Come on. It outranks legal and illegal. Because I'm Come being on. wise, I'm probably not breaking the law anyway. Yes, sir. But I also don't want to put myself in an environment for things that take place at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. For sure. I'll just stay at home. For sure. <laughs> for sure. I'll just wait, you know. So... If the UFC is why, I need y'all to get a streaming service. Something. Right. I need y'all to get that. Whatever Disney Plus doing, they need to do that. Hey, like, they need, they need that. to do that. They need, to, they need a pay-per-view package for Come people on, like bro. me so I can stay in the house and be safe. You know, um, but I tell people all the time, you, you erring on the side of caution and wisdom, you, you, never you go can't wrong, go wrong man. with that. You never go wrong. You can't go wrong with that. You never go wrong, man. I'm not hurting anybody by sitting in my basement avoiding this problem. Mess. Come on. This situation. Come I'm on. not doing that. So... Man, this time has flown by. Yes. I this agree. time has fl- I I'm I'm gonna have to get you back on here so I can Man, dive I into because I have so many I have a million and one questions I want to ask you just about Let's do a part two. Yeah, we, oh let's do that. Let's make that happen. For I'm sure. down for that. This brings me to the last segment of the podcast mm-hmm. called Let Them Know. Mm-hmm. This is the segment where you get to tell the audience whatever it is you want to share, whatever it is you want to say. If God puts something on your heart, this is the floor is yours. My brother, let them know. Man, I just want to let people know that the local church is important. Um, not nothing more than that, man. It's we living in a world where churches has become so virtual um, that it's not it's not visited. Hmm. And the church is important. Um, the church is the most trusted institution um, that we have in the world. Um, yes, we have our issues just like any other institution has theirs, but I will tell you, man, that the local church is important. So for those who are watching and maybe you watch your services every week online, man, go visit one day. That even if you're watching Bishop Jakes and you live in Ohio, find an Ohio church to get connected to um, because community means a lot when we start talking about executing the word and the co-mission and the mission of Christ like community is is very important and so man I would challenge those who are watching man if you know a local church wherever you wherever you're from that's moving and man give them a shot um, because the local church is dying because people don't want to commit to it the local church means something that's it, man. I, I, I could have let them know about some stuff that we were doing here and what we got going, man. But what's more, what's more important is like the church, capital C, grows. The church, capital C, goes to another level. The church, capital C, is supported. And even if that means you don't walk through the doors of the Remedy Church, but you walk through the doors of, you know, Second Baptist Church, I'm right. good with that. Right. I'm good with that. Just find a place to call home. I feel... I. Healing happens in the house of God. Come on. You, you know, transformation happens in the house of God. Come on. I tell people, don't forsake the gathering of the saints. Do not. Do, don't. You, there's, there's things that can happen. I believe God can reach you and touch you anywhere. Come on. I do too. He reached you in a barbershop. Come on. Right. He reached me in a living room. He reached me on a couch. You know what Come I'm saying? On. These things. But, and we're not going to limit God. Right. Yeah. But there's certain things that just happen. When a group of believers just gather 
Come on. One accord, one mind is two or more, and they Come just on. got their hands up just worshiping the Lord. I agree. Scales fall off. Breakthrough happens in the house of God. Come on, bro. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I love the local church. Come on. You know, I, I really do. And without that, I wouldn't have the community and family support that, yeah. I, that I was looking for. That I didn't even actually, I wouldn't have found it. I don't think I knew what I was looking for. I don't Come think on. I knew what I was, I was missing. That's real. Because there's been people to catch me when I was falling. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. And you and I talked about that a couple of Sundays ago when I was here. I think it was a Browns. Was that the Browns home opener? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for it was, sure. Yeah. You know, when we went 1-0, and you know. Right, You right. know, won the first game. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, you know, 17 season. You know right. how it goes. It's just the Browns. I don't, I don't want to diss nobody, but, you know, um, there's another church, Hope City. Their head pastor was cheering for the Steelers when I was recording him. Yeah, man. Tell, uh, tell Ricky, man. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put his name out there. Man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> tell him that's that's a bad look, man. And right. I, and I think I saw him say he wasn't gonna pay his debt. Right. And, right. You know I mean, I saw him all on the ground, just not right. honoring his word right. as a man of God. That's messed up. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's I just up. don't understand, like, why right. a guy like that would do something like that, man. Yeah. So Hope City, man. I'm not. What's going on? It's. A, I'm, I'm questioning some things over there right now yeah man. the stiller fans looking kind of hurt they are they Come are on. i'm gonna pull up on them though i'm gonna just go i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna walk i'm gonna walk right up in there one sunday I'll unannounced come on man. with a sign that says where's my free chicken like come I'm, on, I'm, man. <laughs> come on. as soon as he get up there and Pass start preaching the offering plate yeah. to me yeah i'm going to kfc right yeah please do yeah y'all <laughs> tripping no. <laughs> hope city no, i love y'all i love y'all sure, for sure that's the fam man i have that's another like i have fun Going to shit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. have more fun at church than probably what I should, but no, you, <laughs> I have more I'm fun than what I should. Brother, thank you so much man, for, honor, for doing this. I really appreciate it. I love your ministry. I love your passion for just, I, and thank you for your yes. Man, you know what I'm saying? Thank you, you for your yes. Thank you for your obedience. And I just want to encourage you, if anything, stay on that path. Yes, sir. You know what yes, I'm saying? Sir. And honor your convictions. If I could tell you anything, just honor your convictions. Yes, sir. Because if it's, if it's not, if it's like, you know what, God is telling me this. Honor your convictions, man. Yes, sir. Don't don't compromise on those things, man. Because yes, y'all are y'all are doing some amazing things in this community, man. man all I, glory be to God, bro. So I love it. I love what I, I love what I'm seeing, man. It's just been it's it's a blessing to be a part of it. It's a blessing for me just to even be a part of y'all's lives. So man, thank you, bro. I'm gonna continue to pray and support y'all's ministry. So yes, sir. Thank you so much for doing doing the podcast. Thank you everybody for who who tuned in today. Please like, follow, share. And please check out the the Remedy Church. We're gonna have all of their um all their information posted in the, in the comment section. So please check them out, brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate God bless it. You, bro.